at the Austin History Center. Today is Saturday, June the 15th, 2013. We are in the Holt Reception Room of the Austin History Center, and I have the pleasure of interviewing today Mr. Ernesto Frega, um, who was once a member of the uh, Austin Brown Berets, and then also is, uh, lived here in Austin. Uh, Mr. Frega, welcome. Thank it's you nice for to have you. Gloria. Thank you. Um, before we start, I need to ask you if you allow me to do this interview on behalf of the Austin History Center. Yes, I do, and thank you. Great. Um, let us start with some of the very basic questions that uh, I need to ask you. And first of all, if you can uh, spell your full name uh, for transcription pur purposes. My name is Ernesto Fraga, E-R-N-E-S-T-O. F-R-A-G-A. -A. Okay. And next question for you is, where were you born? And can you also give us a little back, a background about you and your family? My family has been in Waco for 100 years since the Mexican Revolution when my grandparents fled to Texas in 1910. Uh, because some of the family would go work the factories, half of the family would work the cotton fields in the Waco area and the other part of the family would go to Chicago to work in the factories, and for that reason, I was the only one out of seven siblings that was born in Chicago. Uh, and um, I was raised with a stepfather who was in the U.S. Army for 21 years, and I was raised an Army brat. Uh, so that means that I didn't get to live in Waco my first few years of my life. We traveled from military base to military base, from Virginia all the way to Hawaii when it became a, the 50th state in 1959. Uh, and when my uh, stepfather, whose name was Vicente Martinez Jr., retired in 1963, we returned to Waco where I started meeting all of my family, my cousins, and uh, uh, I got to join many of them working in the cotton fields at that time, uh, working as a busboy, uh, entering school, and uh, the schools were still segregated at the time. So uh, we had a lot of problems. Uh, with the public school at the time. I got into a lot of fights uh, for uh, people who would uh, say they didn't like Mexicans. Uh, and, uh, but uh, Waco is my hometown, uh, and uh, that's where I was raised and graduated from high school and entered in college at McLennan Community College. Okay. Uh, how did you uh, get involved uh, politically? What, what what was the main thrust of you becoming involved, becoming an activist? I left home when I was 17. I was still in the 11th grade. We had a dysfunctional family with a lot of problems, and I lived with a couple of roommates, one a Vietnam veteran and one a Baylor uh, student, Baylor University student, uh, Manuel Sestaita and Roberto Aguilar. And it was at that time that I was employed. I, Somebody recommended me for the NYC program, Neighborhood Youth Corps, a war on poverty program for youth. And I started working uh, for that program, organizing uh, youth and children in the barrios of uh, South Waco. And uh, part of my project was to organize a LULAC, Junior LULAC organization uh, that included students from the different high schools and McLennan Community College. Uh, and I became president. Uh, right away with out of uh, 80 students that were organized and within one year got elected to state director. Uh, at the same time, things were changing. A lot of things were happening, uh, not just in Waco, but throughout the United States and Texas. There were walkouts uh, occurring uh, for uh, better uh, conditions in the public schools uh, and for uh, the right to have uh, Mexican American history taught in the public schools. And so we organized a uh, Mayo chapter, Mexican American Youth Organization, an offshoot of the original organization that was started at St. Mary's University in San Antonio. Uh, and uh, with that Mayo chapter organizing the youth, uh, we also organized all of the organizations in Waco, uh, from the churches to the uh, social organizations to LULAC, uh, PASO, uh, and with two members of each organization, we formulated the Alliance of Mexican-American Organizations, 
Uh, it became one of the most powerful organizations Waco has ever had of Mexican Americans because we started forcing every hiring uh, entity to start hiring Mexicanos who were not being hired before. Uh, and many people in, in today's world can say that they retired from the U.S. Postal Service or the uh, Bell Telephone Company, all because uh, we made the effort to get their names turned in to uh, get hired by these companies. That was the beginning of my political life. I was still a teenager. Uh, and as soon as I graduated from uh, Waco High School in 1968, I got hired by EOAC, Economic Opportunities Advancement Corporation, and the title of my job position was community organizer. My job was to organize communities to teach people to help themselves, to organize themselves to learn how to go before school boards, city councils, uh, boards and commissions, uh, to represent the needs and interests of Mexicanos in our community. And you were still a teenager? I was still basically. a teenager, okay. yes. Uh, uh, the Alliance of Mexican Americans, which I helped to found at the time, uh, had me on the board of directors and I was the secretary, so I got to document a lot of what we were doing. Uh, so I had a real interest in documentation. Uh, so uh, one of the projects that we did as uh, Mayo members was to start a uh, barrio newspaper called El Golpe Avisa. And uh, some of the people that uh, I worked with um, were Ramsey Muniz, who later went on to become the candidate for governor for the Brazo Unida party. Rolando Arriola, uh, who eventually went on to become the mayor of Waco, uh, and several other people uh, that uh, became uh, leaders in the community. Uh, these were the people that I was hanging around. I was one of the youngest compared to all of them. Uh, and I was very proud to be a part of the beginning of the Chicano movement in the Waco area. One of the things that we did while we were organizing was to uh, join the uh, Economy Furniture Strike March that was being held in Austin at that period of time. Uh, so we got to uh, join the march uh, in, uh, on Congress Avenue. I met uh, leaders like Lencho and Leo Hernandez who were part of the Economy Furniture Strike uh, and I would later go on to uh, work with them when I moved to uh, Austin in 1970. Uh, that's when I uh, received a job working with the Human Opportunities Corporation uh, that was part of the same agency on the War on Poverty, the Office of Economic Opportunity. And uh, within uh, a short while, I was hired as the center director of the South Austin Community Center. Uh, some of the things that we did there was organize a South Austin Brown Beret uh, organization. Uh, some of the things that we did is we uh, worked in the campaign to elect Richard Moya as being the first county commissioner of Travis County. Uh, and uh, we worked in coalition building uh, with uh, the African American community and student leadership of the University of Texas and St. Edwards University. Uh, I remember uh, working with Larry Jackson, uh, who was considered a militant African American in Austin at the time, Community United Front. Uh, Velma Roberts, who was the leader of the uh, Welfare Rights Organization. Uh, all of this at the age of 20 uh, was working with uh, these people uh, in community organizing efforts. Uh, one of the things that we worked on as Brown Berets of South Austin at the time was police brutality. We had a caseload of cases of people who were abused or beaten uh, by the police. And uh, we, when we heard that a person by the name of Gil Gilbert Rivera had been uh, brutalized at uh, one of the nightclubs in Austin, um, uh, we uh, made contact with him. Uh, I don't know whether he made contact with us or we, we made contact with him, I don't remember, but we joined him in a uh, uh, hearing at the uh, Austin City Council to support him in his uh, case uh, against police brutality. Gilbert Rivera uh, was uh, uh, a new friend uh, and ally of ours at the time, so one of the things we did is we invited him to join the Brown Berets, and I gave him my Brown Beret and asked him if we could uh, expand our group and organize on the east side. And it didn't take very long for Gilbert to be the founder of the East Austin Brown Berets. And uh, that's when a lot of people's memories uh, get started on the history of the Brown Berets in Austin. Where in South Austin were y'all located? We had a, well, my office was at the South uh, 
south uh, way, South Austin Community Center on South First Street. Oh, south First, okay, mm -hmm. all right. Yeah, pretty, because, pretty close to Old Torf. Okay, because a lot of, you know, when you think of the, the Brown Berets or a lot of the activism that was going on, you really don't hear much about South Austin, you hear it about East Austin. So this is a good thing that, that is being mentioned, or at least for me, because now we know. Well, you know? one of the things that we did at the time was, um, uh, since we already knew Lencho uh, Hernandez and Leo Hernandez, uh, we worked uh, close together with them on many uh, uh, issues and campaigns. And to do that, uh, we got to know Marcelo Tafoya, who uh, had uh, radio uh, programming for Mexicanos in Spanish. And he also had uh, a person by the name of Z. Gromo, uh, who was editor of uh, the Echo newspaper in East Austin. And uh, so uh, during that period of time, uh, we were working with uh, Z. Gromo uh, to get a lot of our uh, information out you know, through the Echo newspaper. I have no idea what he may have documented about us at the time, but I do know that once the East Austin Brown Berets got started, I was already working with him. Uh, I had already been working with La Puerta in South Austin, so I continued working with El Echo in East Austin. Uh, and um, uh, started documenting and encouraging other people to write uh, for the Echo newspaper to put a lot of our issues and causes into the paper. In which they did. I mean, there is a lot of good information about what was going on in East Austin and about the Brown Berets, their poems, I mean, pictures, all kinds of information that uh, I really, when I first started to see the paper and doing the research uh, for other things, I was really impressed because I venture to say that the majority of all of those individuals, maybe Zeke, I think maybe for the exception of Zeke, who had gone to UT and I believe was in journalism or had was going into that area, but the others really didn't have that formal training to, you know, that's true. Uh, what, what we um, have to keep in mind is at that time I was 20 years old and so when the East Austin Brown Berets got started many of those members were still just fresh out of high school. They were 18 or 19 years old. Uh, my memory uh, 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 brings uh, Gabino Fernandez and Zico Valle and Elias Mendez who are all still in their mm -hmm. te late teens. Uh, so uh, uh, the experience with working with Barrio newspapers, uh, in my case, dated back to El Golpe Avisa in Waco, Texas. Uh, the other thing that uh, I think is important to note, uh, and this isn't just Waco or Austin, but uh, when we organized Mayo uh, in the late 60s, uh, we wore brown berets and we wore khaki jackets and we wore armbands uh, that had uh, the insignia of the United Farm Workers, which was La Aguila Negra. Uh, so when we had our first Chicano National Conference in uh, Mission, Texas, uh, called La Lomita, uh, we got to meet many Mayo members from Houston, uh, from El Paso, uh, from all over the nation, many who wore brown berets uh, and khaki shirts. Uh, so we were impressed with the uh, brown beret look uh, as organizers of the community. And uh, one of the leaders of the South Texas at the time was Pablo Delgado, who I am still uh, very much in touch with. Uh, and we talked about uh, the fact that we need to organize brown berets. There was already a large chapter uh, in the making in uh, San Antonio at the time, many of them whom we met. Uh, and many of them, of course, were Mayo members as well. That's because uh, according to uh, David Montejano, Dr. David Montejano, uh, the Brown Berets evolved from the Mayo chapters uh, in San Antonio. Uh, and so that was also true uh, in Waco. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, after La Lomita, when we organized the Winter Garden Project that uh, was the beginning of the Raza Unida Party, uh, Mayo became a political organization that started becoming Raza Unida and they started getting into electoral politics. So the Brown Berets took off where Mayo left off and uh, were the cadre of uh, community organizing uh, to organize pickets and marches and uh, confrontations against police brutality uh, and injustices in the community. So uh, that's what the Brown Berets did. We, took over where Mayo left off in community organizing. 
Uh, with, the, with the Brown Berets, when it was formed here in Austin, there weren't very many members. Uh, according to Dr. Montejano, I believe there was like 18 members. Uh, how did y'all really, I mean, because in what I read in the papers and uh, with Dr. Mantejano's books and, and all, uh, how did you manage to get just a small group of people really get out into the community and get the community involved in causes? Well, there's two points I want to make about uh, 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 David Montejano at the time as we knew him. Uh, he was a person that would hang around uh, with us uh, and he'd carry a camera, he'd always be writing notes. We always wondered about him at the time. Uh, but uh, the Brown Berets was an organizing group. We were organizers and what we did is we built coalitions. Uh, and uh, some of us worked with housing, some of us worked with media like I did, uh, and some of us worked with uh, other causes uh, like police brutality. And so what we did in order to get some community action going is we organized coalitions. We, we built coalitions. Uh, and one of the coalition building that we did was the East Austin Committee for Justice. Uh, and this East Austin Committee for Justice was a Brown Beret project that would bring in African American and uh, student and other community people. Amongst them was uh, Juan Hipólito, who had been in the original South Austin Brown Berets. Uh, and he is now, he later went on to become a lawyer uh, uh, and uh, moved to California. Uh, and uh, what we did is we had the East Austin Committee for Justice present itself before city council and in press conferences uh, to uh, show that it was not just a small little group uh, uh, demanding justice or calling on uh, the issues of the day, but it was a wide spectrum of the community. Well, we were very fortunate here at the Austin History Center that we do have uh, that uh, collection. And uh, going through the documentation not too long ago, I managed to find one of the individuals that was a member and was participating in that. And uh, she's from uh, Victoria, uh, Lydia Serrata. And I was sort of like, but she was supposed to have been going to UT, getting a, a, a degree, and then she went on to Harvard and became a lawyer and the first Latina lawyer in, Austin, in Victoria. And here I'm seeing her, you know, being involved. Yeah, I'm so proud of her. And uh, uh, there are, uh, are other people yeah. that uh, I need to mention. Uh, Gabe Gutierrez, who was an attorney at the time, was the attorney that I reached out to at the time to help us with our legal um, uh, advice. He had a young attorney by the name of Malcolm Greenstein that was working at his office, uh, who uh, eventually became uh, the designated Brown Beret attorney for years to come. Uh, and uh, there are many stories of uh, our actions with the Brown Berets where Malcolm Greenstein played a key role uh, in working with this. And Lydia, of course, that you mentioned, uh, was part of our East Austin Committee for Justice. Mm -hmm. We would sometimes meet at her house. Uh, and uh, we would uh, move our meetings from different places. Uh, and uh, so we had the community mobilized uh, beyond the Brown Berets at that time. Right. Which is an interesting thing too because, um, I mean, Gabe Gutierrez still continues, you know, uh, to practice and so does uh, Mr. Green, Green, Greenstein. Greenstein, Malcolm Greenstein. Yes, uh -huh. yes. And so that is the interesting thing also. Another intriguing thing for me, and we go back to the age of each of the members. Exactly. Very young, very young. Uh, but we also remember the time period, uh, the time period for civil rights, the time period for the Vietnam War, the time period for La Raza Unida, Mayo, and all of that that was going on. So the voices really started to get louder and louder, and the students at the university, which is amazing also, were also wanting to be involved in things that, you know, uh, so that is the one uh, impressive thing about this particular project as we're finding out and it hasn't been really fully documented until now as we're doing this research and the articles that we're finding uh, is what I interpret as being recovering and reclaiming that history so that now we will have it uh, in uh, 
document form so that others can come in and have access to it and hopefully someday write a book or whatever, go beyond what Dr. David Montejano That's has written. That's true. Uh, David Montejano uh, knows more about the San Antonio Brown Berets than what he really knew about other Brown Beret uh, groups, so there are a lot of inaccuracies in his books uh, that um, uh, is not as important as the fact that uh, he was around us when we were uh, carrying on a lot of this and he put a lot of that information, including some of our newspapers, into the archives of uh, Yale University. Uh, and my daughter, uh, Fuerza Linda Fraga, went to Yale and uh, called my wife Linda uh, one day in around the year 2000 and said, Mama, do you know that there used to be a Lote Avisa and a Coraje Chicano uh, in the Waco area? And she says, yes, mija, that was your papa that did that. <laughs> And uh, we were just amazed that uh, um, we believe David Montejano was the one that put them in the archives of Yale University. Can you tell us just real quickly, just sort of, um, how you named your daughter? Fuerza. Yes. Uh, Fuerza Linda was born in uh, South Texas in Westlaco during the time that we were occupying uh, El Colegio Jacinto Trevino. And this was in 1978. Uh, 1978 was one of the most pivotal years of our organizing statewide. Uh, and uh, Linda and I were working uh, El Colegio Jacinto Trevino to save it from developers who wanted to sell the land piece a piece at a time. We brought in a lawyer from Houston to take people to court who were doing this and we actually won in court to preserve the land, which was about 33 acres of El Colegio Jacinto Trevino. We wound up uh, using a lot of the land for farming and we let people actually grow crops there. Uh, and uh, we would teach classes uh, of Chicano history, uh, but we used it as a base for organizing all over the state of Texas. And uh, we actually did use that as a base to organize marchas uh, throughout the state of Texas in 1978. The culmination of the year, 1978, by December 2nd, our uh, daughter was born, uh, and uh, we named her Fuerza Linda. She is now an attorney uh, working for a federal district judge in Las Vegas. Uh, she graduated from the University of Texas after having graduated from Yale, uh, and uh, uh, she was a product of the Chicano movement. It was, I found that very interesting when you submitted uh, to me your little chronological timeline about yourself and, and your family, so I just wanted to be sure that we included it in this interview. Um, now, let's go back to the echo. Yes. And uh, let's, uh, you, there was, a, you know, the Centro Chicano, and maybe let's, first of all, let's talk about a Centro Chicano and how it got started. And, uh, El Centro Chicano uh, was a project that uh, I give uh, Paul Hernandez uh, all the credit for. He was from Austin when I was not. He had the contacts of people, including funding sources. Uh, and uh, right there at the Centro Chicano, I remember uh, several of us who would uh, enter uh, information for the proposal to get funding for the Centro Chicano. Uh, and um, I want to show a little picture here of 1974 when during the midst of the police brutality campaign that we had with the East Austin Committee for Justice, we had Mayor Roy Butler and the city manager and the police chief uh, arrive at a caravan of the city uh, staff uh, hierarchy uh, that arrived at the Centro Chicano to meet with the Brown Berets and the East Austin Committee for Justice. And if I can show this to you, this uh, has the mayor and some of the city staff. And we also had the Brown Berets keeping security. And uh, if the camera can see this, right at the very top is Zico Valle with a walkie-talkie uh, keeping in touch with uh, the others downstairs, you know, to watch uh, the uh, security. Uh, throughout the area and we thought that that was a very important period of time where the city and the mayor uh, were trying to come up with some uh, proposals uh, for dealing with police brutality. 
Uh, and uh, the Centro Chicano, of course, was a uh, central point for organizing in the East Austin area. Now, it wasn't, how big was the, because it was a house. It was a small house, really, with maybe two or three rooms. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we had, you, if, if one could walk inside, you could see that uh, it had posters and uh, we had uh, telephones. Uh, we had uh, uh, tables and chairs, uh, organizing materials. Uh, and uh, it was just one of the most fascinating things. Uh, this is a picture from Ellen Pogue's uh, collection of photography from back then. And uh, you see this sign right here. I like to say I'm, I painted this sign uh, that was oh, used okay. in the very front of the Centro Chicano. I wish I knew whatever became of it. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, as we're looking at this, uh, because one of the, when I did the uh, oral history project on the Emma Esparientos Mexican American Cultural Arts Center, uh, we got some photographs for an article that Nancy Flores with the Austin American Statesman used. And uh, we do, if I remember correctly, in the uh, negatives of the Austin American Statesman, there is a uh, photograph of, you know, at Centro Chicano, the, the, uh, the sign, but also a lot of the other items because it was located on, um, what was it, on San Marcos Street? Um, yeah, it was actually 105 San Marcos Street, just yeah. off of uh, East First Street. It well, was very, very, really accessible at the time. Yeah, and it was used for a lot of things. Um, I mean, a lot of uh, uh, good things that were happening or what they were wanting, particularly for the youth. Yes, we even had um, a uh, Cinco de Mayo uh, festival there. We closed off the streets, uh, had over a thousand people there. Uh, and uh, the community uh, treated as Central Chicano as their own. Well, one of the things, and it is in the, uh, in the echo, and I'm going to give it to you so this way you can sort of show it. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Ramon Montejano. Uh, David Montejano? Uh, no, uh, oh, Ramon. Ramon, Ramon mm -hmm. had told me about was the uh, glue sniffing. He had been, that had been one of his things that, you know, as a youth, he would do things like that. And so he went through the Centro Chicano and they helped him. That's right. Considerably. So that was the thing. It was like, you know, a lot of these young people, if they, if, if it had not been for Centro Chicano, um, they say, you know, they wouldn't be what they are today. That's true. Uh, one thing that I would really like to say about the uh, uh, history and legacy of the Brown Berets when people would try to carry a cause, we had this saying that no Chicano needs to struggle for justice alone. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, what we would do is um, we would uh, make sure that uh, if, if people had no other way, if, 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 if they had exhausted every other means, people always knew that they could come to the Brown Berets to see it to the end. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that is the, uh, it was, again, uh, we do have photographs of the, uh, the centro when it got burned down. And um, also a lot of the contents, you know, couldn't be salvaged. So that was another thing also. Um, now tell us about uh, the 1977 uh, when you were, well, I guess you went back to Waco, or how were you? you because, which is another thing also, let I me mean, just ask this question. How did you manage to go from location to location or chapter to chapter without, throughout the state? How did you all do that? Well, that was um, one of the uh, responsibilities. That I, I would say it was a self-appointed responsibility of, uh, of mine, really. Uh, uh, in my case, anyway, uh, Brown Berets uh, made it a point to make alliances uh, with all the other chapters in Texas. Uh, and um, we were all in autonomous groups. 
unlike the California original Brown Berets, the Texas group uh, had met before and voted that we did not want a centralized office uh, or a centralized uh, jefe or, or dues or anything like that. We all chose to be autonomous groups. Yeah. Uh, and um, I was privileged uh, to be able to uh, not just help in organizing the Austin Brown Berets, but to go to Waco in 1974 uh, and uh, organize the Brown Berets uh, in Waco. And that's when we started uh, the newspaper El Coraje Chicano. Uh, the, me and Susana Venteria were together at that time for those three or four years. Uh, and um, uh, so, in 1977, after having organized uh, many events in uh, uh, Austin, I mean in Waco, uh, I moved back to Austin in 1977. Uh, and I uh, got to work with uh, a project uh, called AVID, Aid for Victims in Distress. Uh, my, the title of my job was uh, a Crisis Intervention Specialist because I had already had several years of working uh, as a counselor and therapist and crisis intervention worker with uh, mental health and mental retardation uh, in Austin. Uh, and uh, so uh, in 1977, uh, when I moved back to Austin, uh, we started immediately uh, working on other campaigns. Um, there were uh, uh, many meetings between myself and Paula Hernandez uh, and um, uh, Martin Delgado, who was from San Antonio, Brown Berets. And uh, one of the first things we started organizing was a statewide uh, march to the Capitol on police brutality. Uh, and uh, this was in commemoration of the one year anniversary of a uh, famed case of Jose Campos Torres, who had been killed a year earlier in Houston uh, by the uh, uh, Houston City Police. Uh, so uh, by that time, there were many other cases that had uh, come up throughout the state of Texas where people had died at the hands of police. Uh, so we organized this march to the state capitol, uh, and um, we started working on other projects. Amongst them was to um, confront the issue of the Ku Klux Klan that wanted to patrol the borders. Uh, and uh, they themselves wanted to arrest what they called the illegal aliens. Uh, and uh, one funny thing that we thought was that they had this little poster they would put on the posters uh, uh, that would say that uh, illegal aliens not welcome. However, it was in English. <laughs> I don't know who they expected to read that. <laughs> and what well, we had a uh, press conference at the federal courthouse, uh, and uh, we declared that we would confront the Ku Klux Klan wherever they would show up uh, for the defense and protection of Mexicanos, uh, at any, anywhere in the border. And uh, one of the projects that we did with other Brown Beret groups uh, was to uh, organize uh, at least two caravans, one from the Lubbock area and the other one from the Austin area, uh, that was committed to uh, go to South Texas uh, and uh, seek out the Ku Klux Klan, and we only wanted to find one of them, really. <laughs> and uh, at, during that period of time, there was a, the first national conference on immigration reform that was held in San Antonio. And uh, Paul and uh, Martin and I, uh, representing the Brown Beret, stood before some 3,000 people and announced the caravan. Uh, that was going to be uh, organized uh, to go to South Texas to confront the Ku Klux Klan. Not very long after that, Lewis Beam of the uh, National Ku Klux Klan organization announced on radio that he was afraid that if they would turn in any uh, illegal aliens that they would be notifying the Brown Berets, so they called off uh, their so-called patrols of the borders of Texas and moved to another state. I think I've seen some photographs of that uh, uh, conference, uh, and I think the three of you are standing together. Um, I can't remember if, I don't think it was in Dr. Montejano's book, but um, I, I have seen, I think it was when I Googled yes. and came across that. So uh, uh, tell us about, now let's go to April 22nd, 1978, where 
individuals, about 19 individuals were arrested and assaulted in the uh, boat race, the anti-boat race uh, the demonstration. The boat races at that time uh, was a very hot issue. Uh, Paul Hernandez uh, was uh, making that one of his uh, pet issues because he was involved in barrio neighborhood associations, uh, even members of his own family. Uh, would be complaining about uh, the uh, tourism that was uh, invading our barrios during those boat races. And it really had more to do with self-determination of our barrios, the preservation of our barrios. A lot of people misunderstood what was our beef with boat races per se, but it was really about preserving our barrios, uh, to be in control of our own community. And on that day, of April 22nd, uh, the Brown Berets uh, organized a march uh, from the east side uh, to Town Lake, uh, close to the bridge on I-35. Uh, one of the things that happened, we were very fortunate that a person by the name of Jim Lutz was videotaping that march, uh, and that uh, uh, manifestation that we had, <clears throat> and he was able to capture uh, on video that the police actually deliberately uh, came face-to-face uh, -face with our picketers and actually assaulted uh, and pulling people from the picket line into the street, which caused a chaos uh, because one person, one beret after another, was trying to protect the other. Uh, and uh, before it was over, uh, even plainclothes uh, police, as we found out, were carrying very large nightsticks, and uh, as soon as people would be handcuffed, myself included, uh, they would uh, be uh, hitting us on the head and the arms. And uh, one of the people who uh, received uh, a lot of uh, uh, injuries, you know, from this assault was Paul Hernandez. Uh, even with his injuries, even after we were all put in jail, uh, Paul Hernandez and his brother Sam. Uh, refused to cooperate with fingerprinting and they chose to uh, get on a hunger strike while the rest of us had already been uh, let go and freed from uh, the jail. Uh, and uh, here was where Malcolm Greenstein, our attorney, uh, eventually, uh, in, before the uh, court, was able to have a lot of the charges dropped. Uh, but I have to hand it to uh, Paula and Anderson and Sam who uh, continued that uh, uh, hunger strike uh, and kept the issue alive on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, one of the things that we did during that time was try to organize the community to support us even after that uh, assault took place. And uh, rather than intimidate us, uh, we were able to generate yet another march this is a picture that came out in the Daily Texan, uh, where we're generating, this is myself right here talking to uh, uh, people with picket signs at the University of Texas who are all being recruited to join us in this fight against encroachment of the East Austin community. Uh, and um, the, the march that uh, followed, that one uh, that uh, was in the news of uh, the police brutality, brought out thousands of people from the community, from all sides of Austin. And this is where we started seeing that we were not alone in this. Right. And that is the amazing thing also, is that just about every march, every, you know, area that you are at, there is always lots of people. And again, that intrigues me is we go back to there were just a small number of members, but yet because of what was going on, the impact that it was having, uh, and at the time period, a lot of the young people and so forth wanting to say, hey, you know, you can't do this. And so they were demonstrating and they were supporting. Uh, and, and with the Emma Barrientos Mexican American uh, Cultural Center Oral History Project, you hear about, you get it from Rowan Salinas, uh, you, uh, Vilma Sanchez Ruiz talks about marching with the Brown Berets and all. I mean, a number of these individuals, Francis Martinez, also, you know, supporter of the Brown Berets, and definitely uh, Paul Hernandez, whose name always has come up. Of as, course. 
Yeah. Uh, one of those individuals that stood for his rights and was out there all of the time. I think something that's very important for people to understand about our organizing of that period of time is that uh, people would only have the media like the Austin Statesman or the television or radio to get information about what was happening. What they did not know is that our tactics and our form of organizing was actually uh, filled with strategy. Many of us, and myself included, even Paul and Gilbert Rivera, were actually trained in Saul Alinsky type organizing, the very same type of organizing that Martin Luther King uh, and Cesar Chavez uh, had uh, uh, studied at the Saul Alinsky Institute. Uh, because I was on the War on Poverty programs and because Paul Hernandez was a union organizer, we learned a lot of these Saul Alinsky tactics uh, where we would uh, teach people to uh, win little victories and, and put one victory at a time and people love to join winners. They especially like to see that a campaign continues and we don't give up uh, and we see it through to the very end. Uh, some of the tactics that we used uh, in the Solalinsky training uh, was used in the uh, boat race demonstrations. In this boat, dem boat race demonstration uh, that happened, uh, was, this was probably the last one that we had uh, before the boat races were uh, called off by the city council. What we were doing is we uh, were using legal uh, tactics uh, to thwart the people from actually entering. But we had cars that were deliberately being stalled uh, uh, and we'd stop the car, we'd open up the hood and it would cause long, long lines of people. Uh, and uh, uh, many of these tactics were actually uh, uh, causing the uh, entrance uh, to the boat races to be stalled for long periods of time. And uh, it was very obvious to the city and to all the organizers that yes, this was being de done deliberately, but we were not breaking the law. And these were Solalinsky tactics that we were using uh, that on the one hand were effective and on the other hand were not illegal that would cause people uh, like the police uh, to uh, attack uh, innocent uh, uh, citizens and bystanders. Oh, that was a good tactic. I, now, I haven't read that information. I mean, you know. So a lot of people do not know this. Yeah. They don't know that uh, many of our tactics that we used throughout the years were actually planned uh, and we knew exactly what we were doing. Uh, we knew exactly what the result was going to be. We knew that to use Solalinsky tactics, if we didn't use the media, if we didn't have the media uh, uh, reporting on uh, what we had already prepared, uh, it would be like none of these things happened. So not only were the tactics important, but we had to learn how to use the media. And that's why I'm in the media now, as it is, yeah. uh, because we couldn't rely on uh, the uh, mainstream media. Uh, if they didn't uh, publicize or report on the truth, we had newspapers like El Echo uh, or other newspapers that we organized during the Chicano movement that would put them on the spot and uh, they would see that uh, they did not report everything or, or not the whole truth. Yeah, well I know the RAG was one that would get out there and, and uh, document a lot of what was going on. The Sun was That's another. Right. Uh, and so there were, and then the Daily Texan. The Daily Texan That's would also right. get out there. So uh, that, it, but again, that information, it is not indexed. Right. So people have to sit and look at, you know, unless they specifically know the dates that it took place or whatever, they're going to have to look. They're going to have to research very carefully in order to be able to find that information but they can. I know The Sun, I believe it was The Sun that had a, uh, a wonderful uh, article on Elias and his wife and his little boy at the time. And Elias had long hair and everything and all of a sudden I'm reading this and it's very, you know, um, it was very well written. But it is information. One of the things also that I want to ask you about is the involvement of little children and the family within the Brown Berets because, again, they were family members, a number of them, that were members of the Brown Berets. 
you know, the Hernandez, for instance, exactly. uh, and, uh, and there are others, uh, uh, Adela, I think, Mencias, uh, Salas, you know, Joanne and her family. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about that, how it was that it was a lot of things that were going on, uh, it was always family, always the children? Well, that is uh, one of the uh, facts and truths about Brownbury organizing is, is that it was a family-oriented, family-based, community-organizing effort. I have to point out that uh, many times and very often the women are not given the credit that they're due for organizing or for being right in the middle of the uh, community action that took place. Uh, at that time, uh, there was uh, Susana Renteria, uh, uh, Joan Salas. Uh, there, was, uh, there were a lot of people, Silvia Ledesma. Uh, we had uh, uh, Ines Hernandez, who uh, was part of our Brown Beret movement, although she wasn't a Brown Beret, but she was part of our Brown Beret movement. Many of these people, have throughout the years become uh, very well-known people in the community. Uh, two of them, of course, who got their doctorate. Uh, and uh, Susana, of course, for uh, many years has been uh, not just the founder, but been uh, one of the organizers of the Poder in Austin uh, that uh, has been carried out to carry out the same principles of organizing families in the Austin community. That's an interesting point that you just brought up because as I have researched and read Dr. Montejano's books and so forth and gotten to know some of these individuals themselves, um, it is amazing. And another thing, it's very intriguing to me how they've managed. I mean, Zeke, uh, you, what's this, with the U? Zeke um, Ubaye. Ubaye yes. is and now the Dean of Student Services exactly. in California. Um, you, uh, even uh, uh, with uh, Gilbert Rivera, right. who was marching against the city and, you know, going before city council and all of that, uh, he's got a degree, but at the same time he was employed by the city later on and retired from the city. Uh, and so there's lots of other individuals too, and that is the thing, it's like, you know, they went on regardless of what people would have thought about them back in the 70s and early 80s, they still were very much involved with their community and continue to be. That's exactly right. Many Brown Berets, uh, I can just, just talk about just the Austin uh, group. Uh, if you were to uh, describe a former Brown Beret, uh, today they could probably be an administrator, uh, a lawyer, at least two that I know of became lawyers, uh, a documentarian, uh, a publisher, uh, a businessman. Uh, so many of the Brown Berets continued in their own ways to be uh, part of the uh, difference making in their communities. Right. Uh, one of the things, if you can discuss a little bit about the manifesto, the Brown Berets manifesto, and how it became that it was written and uh, what it really meant to the Austin Brown Berets as well as other chapters. The Brown Beret Manifesto was a necessary uh, uh, thing to write at the time. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we resisted uh, being organized as a centralized uh, office. Uh, we voted to remain as autonomous groups uh, the Valle in South Texas, which consisted of so many cities, Far, West Laco, McAllen, uh, they were autonomous. The Lubbock uh, chapter was autonomous. Uh, the San Antonio chapter was autonomous. The Waco chapter was autonomous. And especially the Austin group. Uh, but one thing that we did need was a manuscript that would at least write down the uh, points that we would stand for that we all supported each other for. Uh, it was not a rare thing and it was a very common thing that whenever a group, whether it was Austin or South Texas or Houston, whenever we organized a march that was uh, uh, bringing up an important issue, 
all of the Brown Break chapters from around the state would join in that march. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's why uh, one of Alan Poe's uh, pictures of a 1974 march that Paula Nardinus organized that, uh, that went all the way to Mayor Roy Butler's house uh, showed many Brown Bray members from around uh, Texas that were part of that march uh, because we were all supportive of each other. But in 1974, uh, which was July 7th, 1974, uh, Susana and I actually uh, played a part in writing the initial notes uh, for what we call the Brown Beret Manifesto and presented it to all the chapters in Houston, uh, where some of them actually came from uh, Colorado, far as Colorado. Uh, and uh, we spent the whole weekend going point by point uh, to uh, state on, in writing what we would stand for, uh, and everybody had input in it. Uh, we uh, had a four-point uh, statement on police oppression. Uh, we had a statement on economics. We had a statement on immigration way back in 1974. Uh, and uh, a seven-point statement on education. Uh, housing, which was one of the key issues that Susana was uh, very interested in at that period of time. Prison reform, medical needs and even uh, media, the importance of media uh, with the Brown Beret. So all of this, all of the skills, all of the uh, uh, successes that we had, we would share with all of the other Brown Beret chapters so that everybody could be in sync in how we would be operating statewide. The David Montejano mentions in the book uh, that the Austin chapter had its act very much together because yes. you manage, and he, he makes a little chart of the different Brown Beret chapters. And the Austin chapter had a headquarters. They had, they were involved in politics and, and so forth. I mean, they were, you know, and so that was the point that I, I was, again, as I looked at that, I thought, going back and remembering the age of the end of the members at the time and how they really were, I guess you were learning as you were going along, but you were meeting lots of other people also. Yes, that's true. Uh, not only were many of the Brown Berets very young, but many of them were in college. Uh, like some of them were coming out of high school, but they were continuing uh, their studies. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we weren't alone in organizing the communities. Uh, it's more, very important to note that there was a women's organization, a women's movement that was taking place at the time also for many uh, women leaders. Uh, Marta Cotera, who had been one of the founders of Raza Unida. Uh, we had the blessing of having people like her uh, uh, in, the way, in the Austin area. Uh, many of the uh, uh, community people who were running for office uh, we were working together with them. Uh, we worked with uh, Gonzalo Barrientos. Uh, uh, we worked with uh, the city council races, not as a Brown Beret organization, but as individuals uh, when it came to electoral politics. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we were working with every movement, whoever was doing something for the community. Uh, that includes the arts. That includes mural painting. That includes music. Uh, that includes writings like poetry. Uh, if anybody was doing anything for the community, we supported them or we were all part of uh, the un unison yeah. of uh, the movement. Which the is time. another thing too that the uh, oral history on the MAC brought out was that the Brown Beret, which then formed Lucha, which then went on and Centro Chicano was part of then later on, the Quintanilla House, when the, you know, uh, and then, of course, everything that was going on in the arts, uh, everything, as you said, that was going on with entertainment and so forth. Exactly. And again, it goes back at Museo del Barrio. Right. You know, exactly. at Museo del Barrio, which is another thing that we have very little information on, and only those individuals that were involved with it at the time will remember, but again, that is very important to note that things like that would not have taken place. And again, we go back to a Floricanto that some of the individuals that um, had, you know, been involved with Lucha and all, uh, also were involved with Floricanto, the first one here in Austin, which 
actually was what, in 1974, I think. Uh, but the first one took place in California and then here. And uh, that had the school district involved, had churches involved, had the university involved. And so a lot of things, a lot of things that stemmed from um, this particular uh, group of individuals and what they were doing. You talk about age, uh, Gabino Fernandez and Ziku Valle and Elias uh, that Gilbert Rivera organized. One of the first things that they did as young men was organize uh, the uh, issue of uh, the education in our public schools and to call attention to the uh, uh, studies at uh, Johnston High School, Johnson High School, uh, to call attention uh, to uh, the lack of education opportunities in that school, uh, they proposed to change the name to Emiliano Zapata High School. Uh, that's what caught the attention of uh, both sides, opposing and uh, uh, pro sides, that uh, caused to have a uh, long, drawn out hearing with the school board where uh, people, not just Brown Berets like Gabino and Elias and Zeke, would go before the microphone, but uh, people from all sides, uh, from the community, were uh, immediately involved in an issue that dealt with education. Uh, so you, you have to think, this is what uh, some of these people were doing at a very young age, uh, getting the whole community involved in very serious matters. Right. Now, we fast forward, and it's been, what, nearly 40 years since the onset of the Brown yes. Berets. Uh, and some of the individuals will talk about the past. I know that when we did the Story Corps, uh, when they came here to the History Center, uh, I had, uh, I had uh, Gilbert Rivera and Elias Macias talk about, you know, the Brown Berets. And then I had uh, Belinda Acosta, who is a journalist here in Austin for the Austin Chronicle. She interviewed Maria Limon, and she talked about the uh, uh, police brutality of what had happened to them at the KKK march at the uh, uh, the state capitol. And so that was, you know, part of the beginning. Uh, but there is always as I always put it, a piece of puzzle that is always being connected to different things throughout. Uh, but it's very, very good information that you've provided us. Now, let me ask you this. Is there anything, as we look to the future, because as I said, it's now been 40 years, about 40 years, uh, but is there anything that you feel that future generations should know about the parade, about Austin at the time that it was, that all of this was going on, about the people that were involved with the Brown Berets. Um, is there anything that maybe we've left out or should be of importance? I'd like to point out uh, that uh, we had a lot of functions, uh, security amongst them, uh, we provided security for the Texas farm workers when they had their uh, long march to uh, the Austin Capitol. Uh, even Paul Hernandez, uh, being in security uh, during 1977, was stabbed uh, and was injured, and uh, we had a uh, benefit for him uh, at uh, Gonzalo Barrientos' restaurant, uh, where uh, we would uh, uh, bring in uh, people from the community. There was a lot of support, uh, but there were a lot of sacrifices that were made. Uh, I myself in 1974 uh, was fired by the city of Austin. I was working in city planning at the time and during the lunch hour uh, went with the Brown Berets to City Hall to the city council meeting calling for the firing of Chief Bob Miles. When I got back to work um, they uh, informed me that I no longer had that job. Uh, and uh, it came out in the Austin Statesman uh, because uh, one of the things that uh, be became uh, an issue there was that uh, we had uh, agencies like uh, e EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, to call attention uh, to uh, our freedom of speech. Freedom of speech I think is very crucial in what we were all about. We wanted to teach people to speak for themselves. 
Uh, and uh, for that reason, we had newspapers that we organized uh, throughout the state of Texas. Newspapers that we had to organize our own selves. And this is why uh, even in 1982, by the way, these are banners of the newspapers that we organized back then. Mm. Uh, this one was the Mario one uh, in Waco. And this was uh, the Brown Break chapter newspaper of Guaraje Chicano. And this was Regeneracion Dos, named after Regeneracion of, of Ricardo Flores Magón, which was organized in San Juan, Texas. Uh, and for that reason, uh, we organized newspapers like Tiempo Newspaper. Uh, when I moved back to Waco in uh, the early 1980s, one of the first things that uh, this newspaper did in the very first year was to uh, highlight and investigate police brutality complaints. And in this case, we have Robert Cervantes whose picture was taken at the hospital showing the bruises all over his face. But inside this paper, we show where the squad car has blood all over the back seat mm. and blood on the pavement, uh, where uh, we uh, highlighted that. We also have brought up the issue of uh, detention centers that uh, are run by private companies uh, that uh, make money out of each person for each day uh, which uh, proves that uh, the whole immigration uh, oppression is an industry that uh, makes money for private companies. Uh, retired wardens, retired uh, uh, police officials uh, who actually have stock in these uh, private detention centers. And uh, this in Waco in uh, 2001 shows where there was a riot that took place in the detention center uh, immigrant, the Immigrant Detention Center in Waco. We brought up this issue in uh, 19, I mean, in the year 2000, uh, and because we had the Associated Press, we were able to make this issue into a national, nationwide issue. And since then, there have been detention watch organizations all over the country. And in 2006, we organized, it was some of, some of the Brown Beret organizers uh, from Austin, Waco, and uh, San Antonio even, uh, and in South Texas, were some of the people who actually spearheaded the massive marches that were held in Texas that were in unity with the rest of the country where millions of people marched against punitive uh, immigration legislation and uh, for immigration reform. Uh, and. Uh, this is a picture of the march we had in uh, Waco in 2006, um, where we had uh, 4,000 people. For a little town like Waco, that's the most people had yeah. en ever seen of uh, Chicanos marching in a town like that. In Austin, they had 40,000. In Dallas, they had a half a million. Uh, in uh, Los Angeles, they had a million. And in Chicago, where it all started, it was, it was a million. Uh, but the important thing that I'm trying to point out with this is that the legacy of the Brown Berets never uh, ceased to exist. It continues to this very day. And uh, not only are we still organizing at our uh, older age, but even our own children are now part of the movement, but they are also getting uh, further education uh, to carry it to yet another level. Uh, because we don't feel that uh, the movement ever was over. Uh, we're simply the continuation of a movement that started back in 1848 when uh, half of Mexico's territory was lost to an unjust war between uh, the U.S. and Mexico. And a treaty was signed called the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, something that the community still needs to be educated about in our public schools. This treaty actually talks about those of us who stayed in the United States and the descendants that came and chose to become American citizens uh, who have rights. Uh, and uh, so we are, we are the descendants. The Brown Berets are descendants of the people who have been struggling for equal rights in the Southwest for over 150 years. And uh, so what we're saying is that the movimiento didn't start in the 60s, it started way before that, for 500 years when we first 
uh, were colonized by the Spaniards and resisted colonization. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that story continues to this very day. Uh, when we had over 150 walkouts around the country, uh, when students wanted our history to be taught in the public schools, that fight is still taking place because we won the right to have Mexican-American studies in universities like the University of Texas and Berkeley and all over the country in Wisconsin. But we still have the fight in the public schools. Uh, we still have the history that needs to be taught in the public schools about who we are, why we're named Chicano. Where did the name Chicano come from? It's the only name that we gave ourselves that the government did not give us. The government came up with the name Hispanic. The government uh, forced us to use the word Latin American. Uh, but we gave our own selves the name Chicano to say who we are, the Mexican-American descendants of the uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848. And so that means that the, that the movimiento continues. Uh, it's going on today and it continues uh, tomorrow. It will continue with our children and grandchildren. The 11 million people that uh, people have been complaining about of immigrants that are in the United States today. In my lectures, I tell people, even Mexicanos from Mexico, all the 11 million people with their children and their grandchildren are all going to be Chicanos. Uh, that's who we're going to be and, that, and uh, the Movimiento Chicano is going through a new life even today. Uh, with the efforts that you're doing, uh, with these forums that are coming up in October, uh, with uh, uh, lectures that are taking place all over the country, more and more people of a young age, of high school and college age, are asking about this Chicano movement. Who was it? What was, all, what was it all about? Uh, and uh, what do we stand for? Uh, and that's what we're all about. Yeah, I. Uh the the reason, as I said, that I you know decided to do this project is because with every project that I've worked on since I've been here since 2008, it's always been that connection, always been that connection, and somebody will always mention the Brown Berets and all that was going on, and so that was you know it was inevitable that this project was going to get done. Uh, one, for the simple reason that David Montejano's book came out just at the time that I was already getting started on it, started to read it, and although, you know, there are a few pages, at least we should be thankful that there are a few pages in that book that do relate to Austin's chapter. But other than that, uh, there really hasn't been that much. If, as far as books are concerned, now articles, yes, there's been some. Uh, also, the fact that a lot of students come in asking for information, but again, if it is not readily available, if right. they don't know the time period, if what all was going on, then, you know, they are not going to search because they won't know to do that. I mean, the commission, for instance, um, the uh, uh, other collections that we have here, the ECHO, you know, uh, or the RAG, or some of these other oral history interviews that we might have if they don't know the people that were involved. And I, as until just recently, I had not seen all of the names of the individuals that were members of the Brown Beret. You would know of uh, Paul Hernandez, of Gilbert uh, Rivera, and just a few, but not very many. And now we at least have a list of some of these individuals, and that's where we're going to do the uh, interviews on them also, uh, because it's important. That's a very important job. Uh, yes. And uh, uh, the um, October uh, series that we're going to have with uh, the different programs and so forth, there will be a, uh, a uh, uh, program on the uh, Brown Beret Latina members, at least three of them. So we wanted to make sure we included that, and that one is going to take place at Resistencia Bookstore. Uh, and then also you talked about the boat races and um, what took place there. We will be showing a documentary that was done also, and some of that with 
some of the uh, images of the police beating some of these individuals. Right. Uh, and so, and then, of course, Gilbert will show his The March of the KKK in 1983. And he's a documentarian now. Yes, right. Yeah. So it is what that, what it is with this project is that we are just, you know, I could not just settle for one. I had to, you know, do what I always do. If, if you're going and you seem to be making an impact, then continue at it. So four programs in one month, plus the photo exhibit at the Dallas Branch Library. And those photos are going to basically come from a number of the members of the Brown Berets at the time that have this information. Uh, because otherwise, we really wouldn't have it. I think it's also very important, Gloria, to point out that the Brown Berets actually are still alive to this yes. very day. Um, I am in touch with um, uh, uh, the Brown Berets from California uh, uh, and from South Texas, uh, San Antonio. The San Antonio Brown Berets are actually active at, at this time uh, in San Antonio. Uh, and uh, they're being reorganized in Dallas and they're being reorganized in different parts of uh, the country. Uh, a new generation is sprouting up. Uh, and um, uh, one thing that is still missing uh, is a, uh, a document or a book that I hope will be coming out uh, sometime soon uh, uh, that uh, shows the story of the Texas Brown Berets. Uh, yeah. And uh, that is one thing that I hope uh, will be available to our generations to come. It is always amazing to me that not very much has been written about this topic. Um, but I'm sure that with this information and everything else, you know, that is now becoming recovered, uh, that uh, there will be something. Uh, well, well, I guess we're getting ready now to wrap up. So is there anything else that you want to, well, say you want to close with uh, as far as your interview is concerned? I'd like to close by saying that there are a lot of you in the community that were a part of this movement that were never mentioned, uh, a, part of this a part of you in the community that sacrificed uh, either your job uh, or your name uh, or even your health uh, for all of the work that has been done for so many years that uh, people like myself and a lot of us are thinking about you. Uh, and that uh, your struggle, whether you were named in it or not, or given credit for your struggle, is going to be showing in the years to come because it continues because of your efforts. And we will make sure that at the uh, October 19th program that we'll have a keynote speaker, Dr. David Montejano, and the panelists uh, that were some of the members of the Brown Berets, that some of those names are also mentioned. Uh, because that is important. I agree. I agree uh, that uh, it's it's not just a few, but there were a number of others. Uh, and so, yes, as many names as we can possibly get, we will make some type of a uh, of a little uh, uh, post or whatever that will have those names of those individuals because they do need to be remembered and they need to be recognized. I think it will be a great service. Yes. Well, I would thank you very much for allowing us to do this interview. It has been a very uh, interesting and, I mean, uh, I'm very honored. Uh, honored in the fact that we have individuals such as yourself that is willing thank to you. travel from Waco <laughs> to Austin uh, and do this, but also wanting to be part of it. And I do invite you to attend whatever you know programs that you're able to attend I look forward that to will it. take place in October and hopefully uh, I can do justice to this project and um, but it could not be done without as you said the community that's right and it's their history it's not mine I'm just trying to reclaim it for them so thank you very much thank you very and much, it's been an honor thank you